Thank you. Right here, please. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, friends, tonight we are inaugurating the delivery of the Washington Institute's Scholar Statesman Award. And I am sure that you agree with me that there can be no two better honorees than the two that we have this evening. <laughs> to, to deliver the award, I call on the Institute's president, Howard Berkowitz. Thank you, Rob. Uh, a great leader once said, knowledge alone is not enough to get desired results. You must have the more elusive ability to teach and to motivate. Bernard Lewis, you are a generation's truth teller and wise professor warning us to understand the past if we are to be successful in the future. As an author, scholar, historian, and philosopher, you are and continue to be a bright light shining on the most difficult issues that our world faces today. And you have that elusive ability to teach, motivate, and lead. Your range and scope of scholarship on the Middle East, Eastern societies, cultures, and religions has no peer. Your deep understanding of not only what has happened, but why and what it means to all of us in the future is exceptionally valuable in how we best deal with these very difficult issues today. One of your many legacies is the enormous number of bright and extremely successful students you have taught and mentored, and how now they now populate extremely important positions throughout the world. It is for this wisdom and unmatched ability to understand, interpret, and convey this knowledge to the rest of us that we at the Washington Institute are delighted and proud to bestow the first Scholar Statesman Award to you, Bernard Lewis, a great teacher, philosopher, and intellectual leader. Benjamin Franklin once said, the gates of wisdom should never be shut. George Schultz, for the past five decades, five decades, you have been called upon time after time for your counsel and wisdom by all the leaders of our country, and you have never failed to provide clear, concise, and meaningful advice. Throughout your life, you have combined scholarship and teaching at our country's finest institutions with the most senior positions within our government dealing with the most crucial global issues. In dealing with these issues, you have constantly shown great courage and great integrity. From these many positions of leadership, scholarship, and as an author and teacher, you have helped our country, indeed, the world, to deal with serious problems with clear, intelligent, and thoughtful solutions, and have helped all of us to be more aware and supportive of the basic fundamental doctrines that have served our country so well for so long. For your valuable advice and counsel, we at the Washington Institute are delighted and proud to bestow the first Scholar Statesman Award to you, George Schultz, a truly great American. Well, uh, this event is a celebration of the role of ideas in foreign policy and an opportunity to honor two truly heroic men of our time, one a scholar, the other a statesman, who have infused their public life with the value of scholarship in the service of the public good. 
So we thought the best way to appreciate our limited time together with these two giants is to have a conversation with them. And the rest of us will be just flies on the wall. So let's begin what is a totally unscripted exchange. Well, almost. Um, and I have to recall that I'm one of the few people in this room that was present when uh, Secretary Schultz delivered um, his valedictory address on Middle East issues as Secretary of State at Y Plantation in, uh, in September of 1988. And I remember very much your opening words to that um, speech, Mr. Secretary, and I, and I use them as the opening for this, um, for this exchange. You said at that time, you deserve, you're a serious group, and you deserve a serious speech. So tonight, we're going to talk about some serious issues with the both of you. Uh, gentlemen, it has been said by many, the 9-11 Commission, for example, that our principal adversary in the world today is not terrorism, but rather an ideology, radical Islamist extremism, whose adherents may use terrorism and many other means to achieve their objectives. Now, as both Itamar and Zal Khalazad said, both of you have experience fighting evil ideologies that go back to the Second World War, where both of you served your nations. Against the backdrop of the great ideological challenges of the 20th century, how would you assess this ideological challenge we now face in the 21st? Mr. Schultz. Well, I think the problem of, I don't know what to call it, Bernard would be much better at this, but radical Islam using the weapon of terror with the objective of changing the way the world works is a major challenge for us. There are others, but this is a major challenge. And I fear that to a certain extent in this country, we're going to sleep on it, not quite appreciating the depth and importance of what we're up against. And I listen to people who are presumably experts. I went to a meeting a few weekends ago where there were four people on a panel talking about different things we were doing. And it seemed to me it was rather miscellaneous. That is, there was no coherent strategy, no sense of what was our underlying way of going about this. And I thought to myself, in the Reagan years and before, as we addressed the issues of the Cold War, we had a strategy, we had an idea. And we had a way of going about it. And fundamentally, that idea worked. And it, it was the way in which we made ourselves cohesive but we don't seem to have such an idea right now. So I'd like to offer you one. I don't want to talk too long. Don't, all right? don't, don't leave us hanging. <laughs> well, in the Cold War period, remember, we had George Kennan, and he gave us this underlying notion that the strategy was to contain the Soviet Union and if we could do that over an extended period, it would cause them to look inside themselves, and they wouldn't like what they saw, and they would change. Now, you marry that in the administration that I'm particularly proud to have been a part of under President Reagan, and we had the notion that the three key words for us were implementing the Kennan strategy, realism, strength, and diplomacy. Be realistic. Try to make yourself be realistic. Don't kid yourself. Be strong. Not just military, but militarily, economically, 
in your willpower, in your convictions. And as you were realistic and were strong, you could be effective in your diplomacy. And that basically worked. Now, we don't have a strategy, and let me suggest what we should be doing. I think we should be saying to ourselves, our strategy is, first of all, we need to resist the spread of that brand of Islam that is associated with hatred and intolerance and violence. And do everything we can to stop that from spreading. And at the same time, to do everything we can with the rest of Islam to help them come into the modern world in a manner that is somehow or other consistent with their religion. That should be our underlying strategy. Nobody, I don't know anybody states it quite that way. Now once you say that, it, all kinds of things come immediately to your mind about what you should do. Not just military things, but if you aren't militarily strong and willing to take action to prevent catastrophic attacks on you and frustrate that, you're not going to win this thing. But it says to you, for example, you better look at education very hard. I've seen some of the things that are taught to young Palestinians. It's appalling. No wonder what happens to them. Or you're taken a different part of the world entirely, Indonesia, which I think has the largest Muslim population in the world as a country. And over the decades under President Suharto, they had very strong real growth. The reduction in poverty on a grand scale and they had an explicit policy as a country that's, what, 95% Muslim or something like that, of religious tolerance. Explicit. They were proud of it. Now I read that with all of the oil money behind it, the, there is an effort going on to infiltrate the schools of Indonesia with a different way of teaching about Islam. Well, we've got to do something about that, and so on. But once you, I'm a great believer that if you have ideas, you're going to get somewhere. If you have no ideas, you're just going to be ad hoc all over the place. It's not going to add up to anything. The ideas are your compass. So in this huge problem that we have, we have to have a guiding idea and then it'll start telling us the things that we should be doing. I might say that when you asked me to come here and have a conversation with Bernard Lewis, I think I said to you, I would be glad to come, but I would rather listen to Bernard Lewis than have a conversation with him. Because he is such, uh, I mean, he, he wrote a book not too long ago called What Went Wrong. It's a fantastic book. And you read the things that he writes, and uh, if you're halfway alert from page to page, you're just bound to learn a lot. So it's a great privilege, Bernard, to be here with you. And as a graduate of Princeton, I'm very proud of the fact that you are <laughs> a professor of Princeton. <laughs> Professor Lewis? You spoke a little earlier of the point of view which has sometimes been expressed that we are engaged in a war against terrorism. And uh, I share the opinion which I think you were expressing that this is a dangerously misleading formulation. The year 1940, the year of my life that I recall most vividly to the present day, 
If Winston Churchill had told us that we were engaged in a war against submarines and bomber aircraft, uh, it would have been a correct statement, but a highly misleading one. Um, terrorism is a tactic. It is not an adversary. And I think in any war, it is very important to know precisely who the enemy is and what the issues are. And in both, res both these respects, I see over the years some improvement, but on the whole, a still rather unsatisfactory uh, situation. I would like to tell you how I see the present struggle, if I may. Please. I see this as the third in a sequence. During my long lifetime, we were concerned with two major struggles against two major adversaries. Uh, the first we might define as Nazism, World War II. The second we might define as Bolshevism in the so-called Cold War. Both of these were deformations, causes which in themselves were not unworthy. Germany is a great nation, and German patriotism is a perfectly legitimate expression of the pride and loyalty inspired in Germans by their great country. But Nazism is a monstrous deformation of that. In the same way, the aspiration for social betterment, for social justice, is natural and laudable. But Bolshevism is the same kind of deformation of that. What we are confronting at the present time is a third deformation, this time of a religion, of Islam. Now, in saying that, I don't mean to go all the way with some people who tell us that Islam is a religion of peace, rather like the Quakers, but without their aggressiveness. <laughs> No, I'm not going that far. But Islam, as we confront it now in these extremist movements, that is a deformation of Islam, no less than Nazism and Bolshevism were deformations of movements in themselves not unworthy. And I think it's very important for us to understand that at the present time and to define our policies accordingly. And what I find very worrisome is a refusal to understand this, a refusal to confront the realities, um, a sort of combined effect of political correctness on the one hand and the ideal, in quotes, of multiculturalism on the other, uh, leave us in a, in a posture of self-denigration, of self-abasement, rather than of resistance to a really dangerous enemy. And I think we should be well aware of the nature of that enemy and what that enemy is and do something very serious. First, to understand it, to acquaint ourselves with it, and then to devise an appropriate strategy for dealing with it. And if I may continue for a, a moment, it seems to me that in dealing with it, there is ultimately only one way, and that is to mobilize the Muslims themselves on our side. Um, in the case both of Nazism and of Bolshevism, those were deformations of worthy causes, and they were a curse to their own people before they became a threat to the rest of the world. And for their own people, in both cases, defeat was a liberation. I think we must try to achieve a similar situation in dealing with the Islamic world and persuade a sufficient number of Muslims to accept, understand and accept that point of view. The version of Islam which is being put out by these people, I can say without hesitation, is a perversion, a distortion of Islam. Just to take one or two obvious examples. Suicide. The Orthodox Islamic view of suicide is a very negative one. If you look at the history of the Islamic world, suicide is extremely rare. It is not an honorable obligation as in Japan or in ancient Rome. It is not a, a solution to personal problems as so often in the Western world. It is a major sin. 
according to Muslim teachings, suicide is a major sin, and the eternal damnation of the suicide will consist of the endless repetition of the act of suicide. Uh, those who believe that by blowing themselves up, they will then proceed with a free pass to the divine brothel in the clouds should learn more about their own religion and its teachings. What they are going to, according to the teachings of their own religion, is an eternity of exploding bombs, of which they will become fragments. It is not easy, but I believe it is possible. And it seems to me that in the long run, that is our best, perhaps indeed, given our weakness, our indecision, our self-doubt, perhaps our only solution. We must free them or they will destroy us. Thank you. I think you heard in both comments by both gentlemen a very common theme about the need to divide the adversaries from the potential allies within the Muslim world. Uh, I think that's a very important uh, comment from both of you. If I could just shift gears for a moment. Um, Mr. Schultz, in his introduction earlier this evening, Roger Hertog made not too subtle reference to some other ideas that are um, making the rounds in polite circles these days that purport to be scholarship in the service of public policy. He referred, for example, to the book by the Harvard and Chicago professors about uh, American politics and the Israel lobby. Now, you have experience fighting ideological battles at home as well as abroad. So let me ask you, given that you have written eloquently on this topic, what is your view about the thesis that there is some controlling power of American foreign policy by uh, Israel and its friends in the United States compelling America to act against its own national interests? Well, I hope there is some compelling controlling factor. Sometimes you wonder. <laughs> but from my standpoint, having spent quite a few years in the cabinet, what we're trying to do is forward the United States interests as best we can in our foreign, foreign policy, foreign economic policy, or whatever it is. You're surrounded by people with all sorts of ideas called lobbies or others. And so they, they swirl around. On the other hand, we have to say to ourselves, we're a great country. We're capable of making up our minds what is in our interests, and then go ahead with actions that are in our interests. And that's what, in my experience, we do. And we listen to lobbies. They're, actually, lobbies are a good thing in the sense that they bring out points of view and information that maybe you wouldn't otherwise have. But then it's up to the government to take all this in and decide what's in the interests of the United States, and that's what we do. So I, I don't even want to talk about that book. It's a disgrace. And I might say to call Israel running an apartheid society is also a disgrace. On this note, uh, Professor Lewis, there is there's another idea that is also quite common, uh, an idea that um, about America's pursuit of Middle East peace. Historically, of course, the purpose of making peace was to advance the idea that Arabs and Israelis can resolve their differences and to bring peace between Israelis and Palestinians. There are many who now also lay on the burden of the peace process the idea that the pursuit of peace is also the way to resolve America's differences with the Muslim, with Muslim societies, to, to resolve America's problem in attitudes around the Muslim world. Do you see the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as the linchpin to resolving the problems that you just talked about a moment ago? No, I most emphatically don't. Um, in considering the, the lessons of history, it is useful, and I realize that this is an unpopular minority view, it is useful to look at what actually happened. <laughs> uh, 
Um, consider the, the, the sequence of events. 1948, 47-48, the first Arab-Israel war, when the, the Arab League rejected the UN resolution and went to war against Israel. At that time, in that first war, which decided whether Israel would survive or not, the United States adopted a policy of neutrality and imposed an arms embargo on both sides. It was weapons supplied from Czechoslovakia, at that time a Soviet satellite, which enabled Israel to survive its first war. The Soviets supported Israel, not because of any sympathy for Jews or Zionism, but because of the plausible but mistaken belief that their principal adversary in the world at that time was the British Empire. And this was a good way of acting against the British Empire. Later, they were cured of that delusion. <laughs> in the second major war in 1956, again, President Eisenhower intervened and ordered the Israelis out of Egypt. And only after he had done so did the Soviets dare to speak. As late as 67, it was mainly French weaponry which enabled Israel to fight and win its war. The United States continuing to maintain an attitude of cautious, and that's the best way of describing it, cautious official neutrality in dealings. It didn't help at all in raising any goodwill with the Arabs. And when the Russians made their move to try and win Arab support, in spite of Soviet support for Israel in the past, they were welcomed with enthusiasm. The first deal that Nasser made with the Russians brought messages of congratulation and ecstatic applause all over the Arab world. Not because they were pro-Soviet, but because they were anti-Western. They saw the West as their main enemy. That is why they had rallied to the Nazis during the war and to the Soviets in the Cold War. The United States had inherited, if that's the right word, the place of the British Empire as the leader of the Western world, and it was therefore the principal target of anti-Western hostility. It was that that determined Arab policy, Arab policies, I should say, hostility to America and attacking America. And, um, what America said or did had very little to do with it. Gradually, in time, an understanding of this began to percolate in some quarters in the United States, though I fear that an understanding of it is still rather limited. Where do we go from here? Again, we come back more or less to the point where we were before, that uh, our, our best hope, our only hope, is the internal divisions within that world. Um, when the Soviet Union collapsed, there was anguish all over the Middle East. As I said, from their point of view, the West was the principal enemy. And historically, this is not implausible. If one looks at the ongoing struggle between Islam and Christendom through the millennia, the West was the main alternative, the main adversary. And they therefore rallied to whoever was the main enemy of the West, the Nazis and the Soviets. With the defeat of the Nazis, they were bereft. The Soviets came and filled the gap. With the collapse of the Soviets, again, they were isolated. I happened to be invited to a joint conference of the European Union and the Organization of the Islamic Conference held in Istanbul at foreign minister level. Um, I was invited as one of a small group of what they called independent experts, invited by the Turkish foreign ministry. It was a fascinating occasion. Um, more than 40 foreign ministers in one place was quite an ordeal in itself. And um, what, what was most striking about the occasion was the frantic search for a replacement. Um, the Nazis had gone, the Soviets had gone. To whom can we turn now for support against the West? The West now meaning the United States. There was some attempt to rally the European Union to fill that now vacant role. And there were some even who were willing to go along with it, but fortunately, uh, they didn't carry the day. 
Um, the search is still going on, and I think one has to understand these diplomatic relationships in these terms. Uh, gentlemen. Can I tell a story? Sure. You mentioned the 67 war. You gave us a very interesting account of attitudes as they played out through these various things. But here I am in 1967, dean at the University of Chicago. And as dean, after the end of each quarter, I held a little party in my house for the students who were at the top. They made the dean's list. And my wife made beans. They called them dean's beans. And we had stuff and <laughs> had a little party for the people who came to bring their girlfriends or their wives. And always there was a young man there named Joseph Levy. He was on the dean's list all the time. And he wasn't just smart. He was savvy. He was, you could just see this young man had it all. He just had that way about him, wonderful. And I had hardly heard that the 67 war had started that I heard that Joseph Levy had been killed. He had somehow understood what was happening. He went, he went right back to Israel. He was a tank commander, and he was killed. I remember it so well, and it made a deep impact on me because I said to myself, what kind of a country must this be that can command that kind of loyalty from such a talented young man. So I think probably a lot of people in the United States had experiences of that kind. That they stay with you and they have an impact on your views. Gentlemen, let me close this, this extraordinary exchange with a very brief question. Um, Given how much each of you has seen and accomplished in your lives, when you look at the multitude of challenges facing our nation, from the ones we've talked about tonight to the ones that we haven't, and I know, for example, that Secretary Schultz is dedicating so much of his effort still to rid the world of nuclear weapons. When you think about all the challenges that remain ahead of us, are you gentlemen optimistic that we can overcome them? Absolutely. We've done well, and we just have to be realistic, look the problems in the face, and roll up our sleeves and do something about them. Number one, let us learn how to use less oil, please. It's so obvious. And we can do it. I remember when, I, when, when the first Arab oil boycott started in 1973, I was Secretary of the Treasury. There was no Department of Energy, so we inherited the problem. And people would come in and tell me about alternative things, and I could see, it's pie in the sky. These people don't have anything. But now, I work on this subject quite a lot. Now. There are all kinds of things there happening that people are getting ready to do that are going to change the situation. And we need to be pouring on all the effort we can to do something about that. And we can, and we'll do something about it. We need to, we need to resist the pressures of protectionism which are rising in this country. And we, we know we don't, it's, we don't have to speculate about what would happen. We have had the experience of the 1930s when protectionism helped aggravate and make deeper the Great Depression and helped lead us to war. We, we know what happens when you do that. And other countries will follow, so we need to resist that. But this problem that Bernard has described so well is a very fundamental and we can't go to sleep on it. We can't somehow say, you know, we haven't been attacked since 9-11, so 
I guess it's not a problem. It is a problem. It's a big problem. And we have to get ourselves a strategy and we have to work on it continuously all the time. Now, let me just say that I have been aware of the Washington Institute for a long time. You said that when you were just getting started, I made a talk at, at a meeting. And I'm on your mailing list. I live in California. I don't, stuff goes on in Washington. I hardly ever get there. And so I can't take advantage. But there's a stream of interesting things going on and a stream of publications and an impact. And I think you have a really important responsibility to see that this effort continues on a high plane. Because as far as I can see, nobody else is really doing much. You don't realize how unique you are. So you have a big responsibility. But I think we need as a country to try to learn from Bernard and try to see if we can't become much more knowledgeable than we are about this world of Islam so that we can grapple with it much more effectively. And we, we're nowhere on that subject here. Here he is, He's the, he is a giant. And then where's the next? There isn't any, there is no giant that's a semi-giant. It's just not there. You're too kind. No, I'm being, as you said, it's important to look at the facts. <laughs> Bernard, a closing remark? Are you well, optimistic? My optimism, such as it is, derives principally from the expectation of foolishness and error on the part of our adversaries. <laughs> uh, this has usually been our best hope in the past. <laughs> Consider, for example, World War II. If Hitler hadn't driven his best scientists into exile, the Manhattan Project would have been a Berlin Project and they would have had the nuclear weapons. If the Japanese had attacked the Soviets and left the United States, instead of attacking the United States and sparing the Soviets, they would probably have won World War II in the battlefields. Fortunately, they made these mistakes, and one can see already that our adversaries in the present struggle are gearing up for similar mistakes and have made quite a few in the past. If you look at the writings and other pronouncements of Osama bin Laden, a man of extraordinary eloquence and frankness. You can get a fairly good idea of what their thinking is. Right through the 90s, he said, it became increasingly clear that the Americans have become pampered and effeminate and incompetent. The refrain was, hit them and they'll run. And everything seemed to confirm it. One attack after another on American bases, warships, troops, embassies, you name it, with absolutely no response except for angry words and expensive missiles dispatched to remote and uninhabited places. <laughs> what happened on 9-11 was the culmination of Series 1 and intended to be the opening of Series 2. That is to say, Series 1 to drive the infidels from the lands of Islam Series two, to bring the true faith to the lands of the infidels. 9-11 was intended to be the opening blast of that new phase. What followed that came as a complete surprise and uh, obviously threw them into complete disarray. Since then, they've been discussing it further and uh, they have watched the debate, the discussion here since then. What we see is the free debate of an open democratic society. What they see is weakness and fear and indecision. That's how it looks to them. And they are drawing the corresponding conclusions. And I have no doubt that this will lead them in due course to make further mistakes of the kind that the late Mahatma Gandhi used to describe as Himalayan blunders. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you will share with me 
a great pride and privilege at being present at an exchange between George Shultz and Bernard Lewis. This has been a fantastic <laughs> evening. I, I, once again, I thank all of you for coming. Uh, I hope that uh, you agree with us that, that these are the, the most fitting men in America that we could find to honor tonight with our first Scholar Statesman Awards. And I want to thank both uh, Professor Lewis and Secretary Schultz for, their, uh, for being here tonight. Thank you all and good night.